Hey, thank you so much for joining me for Strength and Conditioning for Cheer Athletes. I'm Dr. Travis Owens, and I am excited to share this information with you so we can start to get our brains wrapped around what type of strength and conditioning should cheerleaders be doing. Proper strength and conditioning is incredibly important, not only for our athletes, but for athletes of all sports. And unfortunately, we haven't seen an evolution of strength and conditioning for cheerleading like we have with other sports. And in my opinion, that leaves a drastic need for our athletes that hopefully we can start to fill to help them not only perform better, but also to keep them safe and reduce the risk of injuries. Historically, strength and conditioning programs for cheerleading have been pretty lackluster. It was usually an afterthought, wasn't done at all, or if it was done, it wasn't really planned out. It was just kind of thrown together. It included things like push-ups, running, sit-ups, calisthenics, things that were easy to implement versus necessarily being the most appropriate. Usually if there was a strength and conditioning program that was implemented well, it happened more at like the collegiate level, um, some of the higher level uh, competitive style programs, uh, and perhaps athletes that just felt the, the need to train, uh, to get stronger, to get faster, uh, things of that nature, and they would go and create their own program to f try to tailor fit that program to cheerleading. And a lot of times that was done well. A lot of times it usually it, it wasn't done well, uh, but there really wasn't a framework for our athletes to turn to. So a lot of it was just guessing. When I was in college, we were very, very fortunate to have a strength and conditioning coach. And I know a lot of college programs uh, here in the United States do have some sort of strength and conditioning program or strength and conditioning coach that they can turn to. But then again, on the other side, a lot of them do not have that resource. And so they're left trying to figure out what should we do that's most appropriate? And if doubt starts to creep up about the appropriateness of, of a plan, a lot of times we just skip it and it becomes something that we omit and we get into that mindset of, well, they didn't really do that in the old days, so we don't need to do it now. And that is not the best way to approach preparation for uh, a sport. And so when we get into that, that, that exact discussion of, are we a sport? Now, this is a rhetorical question. That's a whole different topic that, that we could take a deep dive into. Uh, you know, this idea of are, are our athletes athletes? Are they in a sport? Again, thinking about our athleticism that we portray and the fact that we're on the cusp of Olympic status. We have international competitions. We train very, very hard in sports specific things, but yet we don't train in a well-rounded way like athletes of other sports do. And so in my opinion, yes, cheerleading is a sport. Our competitors are athletes. So when I think about the difference between high level athletes of multiple sports, and then I see that cheerleading unfortunately has not had that same approach. They haven't had that same mindset and that same vision for how we can evolve our athletes, I wanted to create a dialogue and programs and things of that nature to fill that void to help continue to push our athletes to be the best that they can. I'm a firm believer that if we build our athletes the right way, the demands that we ask of them should not be too much. When we look at the growth of athletes from age group to age group. We also look at the, the challenge that comes from jumping from a level one to level two to level three and the skills that they need to be able to perform at these levels. And we also look at the time frame that our athletes grow. You know, in just a, a couple of years at times, we'll see athletes jump from level two, level three, up to level four, five, six, now level seven. So there's not a lot of time for them to grow because we want to fast track their progress to get to higher level, higher level teams. And so I don't believe that this is an, an unrealistic goal if we provide them with the things that they need to appropriately grow strength wise, flexibility wise, conditioning wise. I don't think that, if, that that's, that's out of the picture or out of the realm of possibility if we provide those things for them. And so when we look at our strength training, you know, what should we do? You know, the question of what should we do to fill this void? 
Well, the first thing that needs to be discussed is our strength training. And it's because the majority of time we have minimal to no strength training and a lot of excessive stretching. And in working in a clinic setting and working with athletes of all sport and all ages, the one thing that I find with our cheer athletes is that there's such a heavy focus on flexibility and minimal focus on strength. And in a clinical setting, a lot of times injuries come from imbalances in strength and flexibility. Some, an athlete will have too much flexibility in one area of the body and not enough flexibility in others. That they'll also have adequate strength in some areas of the body and not adequate strength in other areas of the body. And so we get this really skewed, ba- you know, off-balance athlete that makes them more prone to injury and perpetuates these injuries over time. And it's because these imbalances is, are, are like driving a car that's not in balance, right? It's just like having, you know, one of our tires, uh, wheels and tires is not balanced. And so that car at first, we're not going to notice a huge difference, maybe a little bit of a wobble, but over time it starts to wear that car down to where the entire car is shaking and not working properly. And we got to think about our body is the same way. If we have these imbalances of strength and flexibility, you know, at first we may not notice a huge difference, but over time it's going to wear the body down and it's going to lead to injury prone athletes or athletes that unfortunately face burnout. And we know, we all know how frustrating it is when we have an amazing athlete that's got so much potential and yet they get burned out, whether it's due to over, you know, not recovering enough, not training right, um, or just repetitive injuries that they, they just get sick of dealing with. And so strength training should be, you know, if, if you walk away from this presentation with any, with anything, it's I hope that I can plant a seed in your head to implement proper strength training protocols for our athletes. Additionally, cardio. You know, I, I know I talked a lot about strength and we're going to talk more about that, but cardiovascular conditioning is also extremely important if it's done the right way. And we're going to talk about what the right way is here in just a minute because we have different styles of conditioning, what we call metabolic conditioning, that are most appropriate for different sports or different activities. And so we want to make sure that if we're going to implement a program that works for our athletes, we need to make sure that it's specific to the demands of our sport and not general or specific to the demands of another sport that we're trying to tailor to cheerleading. And then recovery training or active recovery. These are exercise routines or exercise plans, low intensity things that are done on days off or days with minimal training to help with their recovery. You don't have to rest totally to recover. We can actively recover. And there's actually benefits of active recovery to help blunt things like excessive muscle soreness, that tightening up of muscles and joints that happens when we train really, really hard and our, our, our body gets stiff. Uh, active recovery days can help to, to blunt those effects and actually help our athletes to be able to come back uh, for an intense training session or intense practice Uh, much more ready than they would have if they just did nothing uh, but just rest. We we mentioned cardiovascular training, uh, and you heard me say that metabolic conditioning uh, being different styles. And so what we have here are the three energy systems of the body. Now, to keep this extremely simple, energy production in the body or energy utilization happens in different ways under different stresses. So An example would be if we take just running, if we just said running alone and we wanted to say what are or see what are the three energy systems that the body utilizes with just running. And then again, we can adapt this or kind of expound on this with other activities. So if you were to have an athlete run a hundred yard dash or a hundred meter dash in Australia, if they ran that hundred meter dash at the highest intensity that they could, that would be our phosphagen system or our sprint system, that burst of energy, that explosive power system that cannot be maintained at that intensity for a long period of time. Longer than, you know, this is eight to 10 seconds, I'd say up to you know, 15 to 20 seconds would be the maximum amount of time that you would be able to push your body that hard. That's our sprint system. The middle range system, that glycogen lactic acid system, 
would be if we were to say, hey, I want you to run a 400 meter or you know, 400 to 800 meter run. They would not be able to run the four to 800 meter range at the same intensity that they did the 100 meter. If they did, they would, or if we tried to chart that, we would see that performance output would start to drop and that they would not be producing as much energy towards the end of that 800 meters as they did towards the end of the 100 meter. So we can't push ourselves the same intensity for the same duration of time. We may want to, or it may feel like we are, but the body doesn't work that way. So that mid range is also very, very important. And then our last would here would be, you know, say our, our long energy system. Let's say if we had the athlete run a 5K or a half marathon or a marathon, again, we would not run the marathon or the half marathon with the same intensity that we would be able to run that 100 meter or even the mid range uh, in between. And so when we look at cheer, we have to say, okay, well, if, if we know these energy systems are the fixed way that our body operates, so to say, then we have to say, how does this apply to cheerleading? How are these energy systems utilized? And if we can tailor fit a program for cheerleading, it must match with the appropriate energy systems to be the most efficient. And what I mean by that is if we look at cheer and we look at the competitive side of cheer, we're looking at routines that are two and a half minutes. If we add in some sort of sideline piece to it, there's nothing really in the sport that lasts more than you know, three to five minutes at a time. We have warm-up floors and things like that at competitions where we may have a little bit more time, but we're not going you know, for the entire time without a break at full intensity. And so when we look at the three energy systems, that sprint, that mid-range, and that long range, there's really only two that apply directly to cheer, and that would be our sprint and that mid-range system. And that sprint system is going to fall into things like our explosive, power and our speed movements, things like jumps, things like a tumbling pass, uh, things like uh, a high, you know, the high intensity part of a dance, um, you know, a basket toss where we have to explode, create really fast explosive power. Uh, and when we look at training, sprint type training, we have to train in a way that matches that. So we would want to look at things like plyometrics, which would be like jump training. We also want to look at moving weight and moving our body in explosive ways. Now ways that we can do that involve things like sprint type activities and then also what we see here which would be Olympic weightlifting. Now I know the second that we start talking about weightlifting with cheerleading that becomes a bit of a question mark for a lot of programs and the reason for that a lot of times is the resources like the actual equipment to be able to do things and also the ability to teach these things appropriately. And those resources are out there and we'll talk about how we can get connected with those. When it comes to plyometric training, now this is something that can be easily implemented for most programs because jump training or explosive training is something that can be done with equipment that we already have and can be implemented with relatively little difficulty. We can see that our entire routine falls into that mid-range energy system. And then within that, we see those sprint type energy production with our jumps, our tumbling, basket tosses, etc. When we want to train mid-range energy systems, the easiest way to do that is to train with interval training. And so when we would get into our strength and conditioning programming, we would want to have blocks of activity that we would do for no longer than a couple of minutes at a time. These workouts would be short to moderate length and they would be done at a more high and at a higher intensity, I should say, than necessarily lower intensity for longer periods of time. This style of training would involve, again, these intervals that we discussed. One popular interval that's, that's utilized a lot throughout all sports is called the Tabata interval. A Tabata interval simply is a two to one work ratio that's performed for four minutes. The Tabata specific interval is a 20 second work time and a 10 second rest time. And the way that we could implement that would be, uh, for instance, 
you would set a four minute clock and you would have your athletes perform one exercise or alternate between two and they would work for 20 seconds at as high of an intensity as they could and then they would rest for 10. And then we would repeat that eight total times. And that 30 seconds of a 20 second work with a 10 second rest for a 30 second interval times eight reps would be our four minute block. Now, when we do a Tabata interval, the, the goal of that exercise or that, that, that specific interval is to work at the highest intensity that you possibly can. And so we would want to pick moves that work the entire body and that are safe to perform under fatigue. For instance, a burpee, perfect example of a perfect Tabata exercise. And what that would look like is, again, a four minute clock would be set and we'd count down three, two, one, go. And for the first 20 seconds, our athletes would perform burpees as fast as they can. And then they would rest for 10 seconds. Then they would perform the 20 seconds of work again, rest for 10 seconds. And we would repeat that over eight reps. Once we get done with that eight reps, it's only been four minutes, but I guarantee you, your athletes are going to be winded. They're going to be challenged by that. And if we look at how that particular four minute block compares to a routine, yes, it's a little bit longer, but we also look at that and say, we've got some built in breaks those 10 second breaks along the way. And if we were to subtract those 10 second breaks out, we're gonna get pretty close to the length of time for a routine. That also kind of ties in well with how a routine is built. Yes, athletes are moving and they're going from piece to piece, our tumbling stunts, jumps, etc. But there is some built-in breathing time in most routines that would allow an athlete to kind of catch their breath, get set, and then perform the next piece. And so this interval style training is extremely similar to our style of competition. Other ways that we can work this would be things like stations, where we would have multiple stations that athletes could work at and rotate through. And again, we're only gonna work up to, you know, roughly two and a half minutes, which would be like the length of our routine. And we're looking at short breaks there, um, and at times no breaks. So just that transition time from one to another. And it doesn't have to be uh, two minutes and 30 seconds. It's just throwing a, a number out there that we're all pretty familiar with, um, but having stations with a set work time where athletes look to perform as many reps as possible is another easy way to implement a interval style training uh, into your program. Then we can also have things that are single workouts, similar to that Tabata interval uh, that we talked about. That's a single fixed workout time frame. Uh, there are workouts that that utilize or that are designed with a two to four minute goal. Uh, in the sport of CrossFit, there's a workout called Fran that utilizes a pull up and a thruster. And what a thruster is, is a front squat. So holding weight in front, we do a squat down. And then as we stand up, we press the weight back overhead, which would be very similar to stunting, kind of going down into a dip position and then lifting overhead. Fran is a workout that is 21, 15, nine, that's our rep scheme. So 21 reps, 15 reps, nine reps. And we alternate between those two movements. So it would be 21 pull-ups, 21 thrusters, 15 pull-ups, 15 thrusters, nine pull-ups, nine thrusters, alternating back and forth. And your goal is to complete that work as fast as you can. And it's a sprint and it's designed to be done in a four minute time frame or less. And there are other types of workouts that are similar to that with that similar time domain that we could implement into our strength and conditioning uh, very, very easily. It doesn't have to be pull-ups. It can be other things as well. But there are specific workouts that we can start to add and get our athletes doing that are specific to the time domains and the energy domains that we want them to work at to become better cheer athletes. Another really easy thing that you can do for, for that uh, mid-range style of training are routine, uh, routine repeats. And what I mean by routine repeats are have your music playing. Get an eight count music. Uh, you could, you know, on YouTube, there's the eight count music songs. There's your own team music. And it's two minutes and 30 seconds. And on every eight count, the athletes can perform an exercise, uh, a repetition of an exercise. Uh, for instance, we talked about the burpee earlier. On every one of an eight count, have them perform a burpee. 
So the music would start five, six, seven, eight. On that one, they would perform a burpee. And then on the next one for the next eight count, they perform another. And on the next one of the next eight count, they perform another. Or they could do a squat, or they could hold a plank and do a push up, or they could do a sit up. They could do a lunge, they could do anything. But having that, again, set time of two minutes and 30 seconds that they're familiar with and working within that time domain, we can really tailor fit the needs of the athlete with the workout. And one thing you can also do is you can start to combine things where we have, you know, our, our routine repeats, for instance. Let's say if we did two minutes and 30 seconds of squats. So at the one of every eight count, we did a squat. Then we gave them a, a 30 second break, ran the music again, and instead of a squat, they did a push up. And then we gave them another short break after that. We did it one more time, and then we had them combine everything, and they did a burpee for the last one. And so instead of just doing one straight through conditioning piece that they would likely get burned out through the middle of and start to lose that intensity, we say, okay, we're gonna do these little chunks that have one movement, but is in a fixed time that they're familiar with, and that's going to apply to the sport and to their competition, uh, or co their competitive routine, essentially. And so we can keep it much more efficient while using either the same time we typically would train or even shorter. And that makes it much more easier to implement into practices or into their schedule versus trying to fit long duration things that are not gonna help in the end. So an example of this type of training that could be done is here of the cheer strength and conditioning. The first piece is a strength piece where they're doing shoulder press and side arm lateral raises. So this is a shoulder, more shoulder specific strength and conditioning uh, routine for this day. Uh, so they would be alternating between a shoulder press overhead or uh, straight arm lateral raises lifting out to the side. And again, using uh, barbell, dumbbells, or resistance bands. And then for the second piece, we have five minute blocks for four rounds. So they would perform four rounds of five minute blocks that they would work. Um, and so the work that would be done in that five minutes is 20 pike presses, which is like a down dog shoulder press, 40 squats, and 60 four count mountain climbers. So they're in a plank position and they're driving their knees forward, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, three, et cetera. And they would perform that 20, 40, and 60 in that five minute block as fast as they can. Their rest time is the remaining time of that five minute block. So let's say we start their first five minute block and the athlete is able to perform all of that work in three minutes. Well, then they would earn a two minute rest to recover and get ready for the next block. And by having that work to rest ratio determined by how hard they push, they actually earn more rest by performing harder. And so that's going to gear their mindset into pushing harder up front and sustaining that so that they do get more time to rest between each of the rounds, uh, uh, each beginning of that next block. So this is a very easy thing that you can implement, a very easy workout that uh, I'll share the, where you can get this specific workout and others like it. Um, but this is just an idea of a, of a strength and conditioning routine that can be added in uh, as a standalone training day where they work out outside of practice or it could be something that's implemented uh, right there in your gym. And then we get to our long duration. So we've talked about this sprint type training or the sprint energy system. We've talked about that mid-range energy system and then we get to our long duration. And the question becomes, is this even a necessary training style or energy domain that we should address in our sport? And if we're looking at well-rounded athletes, then yes, LISS is low intensity, steady state exercise. HIIT or HIT is high intensity interval training. And so when we look at this, you know, this balance between high intensity interval and low intensity steady state, for, for health purposes and well-rounded athletes, yes, the, the low intensity steady state exercise is not unimportant but if we look at our practice schedule, let's say we look at what we're doing in the time that they're at practice, that low intensity steady state is actually built into the structure of our practices. 
our athletes are constantly moving and doing things. Yes, we give them water breaks. Yes, they have breaks between repetitions. But when we look at their heart rates, they're usually kind of hovering in that low intensity heart rate that we would we want to see for low intensity training throughout the majority of that practice block. And so if we were to say that their practice has this low intensity steady state heart rate that they're 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 kind of hovering around and then we only condition them with long duration 20 to 30 minute you know cardio or calisthenic type training then we find ourselves only training low intensity uh, steady state cardiovascular conditioning and then the only pieces of the sprint type training or the mid time the mid range fall in the practice itself. So there is actually no additional strength and conditioning that involves those two systems. And so we become off balance. We're training more for steady, you know, long duration, steady activity, which isn't what cheer is. And we're omitting the sprint, you know, additional work at the sprint and mid range level, which is what cheerleading is on a majority state, uh, on the majority of cheer is. If we say, okay, we're constrained by time, if we're only going to do a little bit of strength and conditioning, then we need to do the things that we're not doing a lot of, which would be sprint and mid-range training because the practices, again, have it built in for that, long inten- or that low intensity steady state. And so if we look at when we can implement these things, there's a couple of different places that we can look to bring this strength and conditioning into your program. If we're gonna do it at practice, there's gonna be two different ways that this can be implemented. One, if all of the practices that your program does are run similarly, and that meaning that, you know, kind of every practice is similar to the one before you have, you're gonna hit every part of your routine throughout that practice, and it's gonna be roughly the same time frame, um, then you're gonna want to perform it at the end of your practices. Uh, And the reason for that is that even though strength training is more appropriate to be done before conditioning, we must take athlete safety into consideration and not want to fatigue athletes before they perform intricate acrobatics and things like lifting other athletes overhead. So we don't want to fatigue an athlete purposefully before they go and do these things that require a lot of skill and precision. And so even though when we look at not cheerleading practice, but just like a workout day, it's most appropriate usually to perform our strength training first and then our conditioning training second. If we're going to have strength and conditioning implemented at practice, I would want to put that at the end because I don't want athletes performing these high, you know, high skill set activities under fatigue that's going to promote potentially an injury. And so if all practices are the same, we want to have those things at the end. If our practices vary in design, then we can look to perform these at the beginning. So let's say, for instance, if you have days where athletes are only working, you know, their dance or they're working jumps or they're working, you know, standing, tumbling, things that aren't, you know, going to require a lot of coordination in in a, in a, fixed time frames, so like running an entire routine, more working individual skills and things of that nature, then we can say, okay, well, well, perhaps we do our strength and conditioning at the beginning of that practice. And then after that, we go through things like our single skill work, you know, working on jumps or working on maybe some standing tumbling, or maybe going through walk through for the routine, cleaning up the dance, etc. And so if we're able to vary our practice schedule, of the individual practice itself, then we can look at implementing our strength and conditioning more in the front end of it, which then those activities after we're less concerned uh, for a risk of injury because we're not lifting other athletes. We're not you know, throwing baskets while we're completely exhausted uh, and things of that nature. And so having some variability with your practice can also be a way that we can implement strength and conditioning without necessarily overhauling your entire schedule. In an ideal world, we would want to at least have one day a week where we have only strength and conditioning. So we allow them to push themselves at a high intensity for just their strength training and their metabolic conditioning. 
and then allow them to have the rest of that day to recover before they practice again. Well, when I was in college, we would have uh, two days a week where we would do strength and conditioning, and then we'd also have two to three days a week of team practice, and then also our games and things that we would cheer. And so we actually very rarely would have practice and strength and conditioning on the same day because the importance of each didn't, you know, we didn't want that, that to be, you know, that gray area where we start to cross over and one starts to affect another. So in an ideal world, if we're going to push our athletes to train more, which in a lot of times with our world's teams or summit teams, things that, um, that we, we ask of them to, to put a little bit more time and effort, then instead of just saying, hey, we want you to come in one extra day a week and work on you know, your baskets or work on your dance or work on your tumbling, instead have one extra day a week where they have a fixed strength and conditioning programming that they should do that will help to make them better at those activities without necessarily having to do just those activities uh, themselves. And so separate day, again, having some time where all they do is strength and condition is a very, very helpful way uh, and a very, very uh, smart way to add in effective strength conditioning to your scheduling. And then again, we also have, you know, look at our on season and our off season. Now, I know cheer doesn't really have an off season for a lot of people. They tend to roll, you know, one season rolls into the next, maybe a couple of weeks off. Uh, but a lot of times there's a, a period of time from tryouts to starting where we're not practicing as often, or perhaps we do have a little bit of a break. And during that off time, would be a perfect time to increase the intensity of our workouts and to increase the amount of workouts that they're doing throughout the week. While they're on season, we don't want to necessarily burn them out by doubling down on how much activity they're doing and saying on top of all of your practices, you also have to do all of these extra strength conditioning days. What we can look at is more focusing on just strength training if we're limited by time, just focusing on strength training because the intensity of practices should help to fill that gap or fill that void um, of the mid-range and long-range system. So if we're, if we're constrained by time, focusing on strength over anything is going to be more beneficial because we don't have a lot of built-in strength training within the aspects of the sport. Stunting, tumbling, jumps. Yes, those require some strength to lift and things of that nature, but not to the level where we would, and the consistency that we would want to see progressive improvements in strength. Yes, you can get stronger stunting. I'm not saying that, but if we want to have the ability to chart progress or to see strength improvement, we need heavier loads, uh, heavier weights that we're lifting besides just our flyer repetitively over and over again. We need a bigger stress on the body for it to be able to respond and get stronger. So on season and off season can also vary with the style and volume of strength and conditioning. And then a big question that comes in from parents a lot and from coaches is weightlifting for kids. Is it really safe? And the truth is, yes, the, there's an old wives tale that with kids lift weight, it's bad for their body. It stunts their growth. Um, all that has been completely debunked. There's no research behind uh, that supports that mindset. Uh, and it actually, what the research does show is that kids that do get into some sort of weightlifting programs uh, or incorporate that uh, at an earlier age actually have better athleticism and muscle coordination that translates to other sports like cheerleading. Uh, and for example, you know, one, a beautiful example of this is there's an athlete named Colin Cockrell who is at this point the most decorated uh, cheer athlete in the world. He's won NCA partner stunt twice. He's uh, won NCA uh, NCA national champion with his team multiple times. He's also a multiple time USA uh, world champion with Team USA. Colin's background before he got into cheerleading is Olympic weightlifting. So lifting barbells and 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 doing the clean and jerk and the snatch, the 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 thing that we showed earlier that translated so well into partner stunning that he was able to easily work, you know, kind of easily lay a foundation where he could work up to become the most, you know, the most, probably the most decorated athlete that we've had. His abilities were so incredible that Team USA Cheer actually partnered up with Team USA Weightlifting 
to help work on the conditioning and the training for their athletes. And so it's, it was so apparent that this style of training translated so well that they created a partnership to help build better athletes. And so weightlifting, yes, it's safe and it's incredibly effective at building stronger uh, and more capable cheer athletes. And so we look at all these things and say, okay, I'm on board. What do we do? How do we do it? What programs do we recommend? What type of conditioning and strength programs do we recommend? There's not a lot of resources out there. And I agree, which is why I felt it so important to start creating these types of programs and hope that others will recognize the, the capability of our athletes once they start to strength train. And so for here, this is a program that I created. It's called Stunt Strong. The initial thought behind it was looking at our bases and back spots, uh, thinking how can we increase strength, and this can be for our co-eds as well, for our guys, increase their ability to, to stunt well and to strengthen their body to perform these movements uh, more efficiently. And the basis behind our Stunt Strong program is total body strength. Now within this program, there's also those metabolic conditioning pieces that, that cover that sprint and mid-range uh, sprint mid-range energy systems that we've discussed. Uh, but here was kind of the first dive into some strength training protocols for our athletes. Now, additionally, we get to our flyers. And you'll notice it's also total body strength. So total body strength is not important for one position on, uh, on a cheer team and not for others. Every athlete on that floor needs to focus on strength. And so I wanted to create a flyer specific program that helped to strengthen flyers in the most appropriate way for their body positions and things that they typically do in a routine that our bases and back spots don't necessarily do. And so five minute flyer became a flyer specific strength program that could be implemented in just a few minutes a day. That's really fun. It's almost like a game how we can implement this, uh, but it again focuses on strength and this program can actually be done with little to no weights the stunt strong program does require the use of weights and so we have to then start to talk through and think through how can we make sure we have the equipment necessary for our gym and for our program additionally hit zero conditioning is a a, a hundred workouts that are cheer specific that require little to no equipment as I started to talk to programs that wanted to implement proper strength conditioning uh, to their schedule, the biggest barriers came to equipment and trying to figure out how do we either not have equipment and still train our athletes um, or have little to no equipment and still train our athletes. And so uh, hit zero conditioning was a, is a routine that's designed to address that question um, and is one of the easiest ways to implement strength and conditioning into the program um, because within this per, within this uh, this guide, there are a hundred workouts that can be you know thrown into your schedule. If you did two a week, it would last you a full year, and you would never repeat uh, a single workout. And in this, there are uh, all three of those energy systems are addressed. The long intense you know low intensity long duration energy system isn't really done. That a lot of that long uh, time frame conditioning. There's not a lot of those workouts in there for the reasons that we've discussed, but there are a lot of those sprint and mid-range workouts that do translate uh, perfectly into cheer. And so this one was, was created for gyms with little to no equipment in mind or for athletes that are training at home. And when the pandemic happened, uh, this was extremely helpful for a lot of programs because they could... Uh, they could utilize this this, uh, this manual and send workouts out to their athletes uh, that they could do at home. So I was really, really excited about that. And then we get into our skill-specific method, our skill-specific uh, training, looking at things like our jumps, where we have workouts that are tailored specific to a skill, utilizing a lot of the principles that we've discussed, um, and also into our tumbling, like our back tuck. So taking the back tuck itself and looking at I need some explosive power, I need core strength, and then I need the cardiovascular ability to be able to perform multiple repetitions over and over again without affecting my form. And so the Back Tuck Cookbook was designed with all of the pieces of a tuck, the explosive power, the core strength, and the necessary conditioning to perform multiple reps were all tailored in and the workouts 
within, within this program um, are tuck specific. Now, yes, if you perform these exercises or these workouts, you will see improvement across the board in your athleticism or in your athlete's athleticism, but it does have more of a tailored fit to a specific skill. And then additionally, on my Instagram account, I, I post workouts regularly. If you were to scroll through, uh, there's dozens of workouts that I posted that were similar to that one that we did above that showed the, sh the shoulder strength and then that the interval blocks that we talked about. Um, that's an, a workout that's available um, on my social media that you can access completely free. And uh, those workouts there, uh, we're constantly updating, putting out free content, free workouts for cheer athletes. And a lot of times those will have uh, ways it can be done with little to no equipment. Um, sometimes they will require some equipment. And that gets us into our last piece, which is how to painlessly implement a plan. So the first thing we have to do is we have to have a plan, right? Uh, if we don't have a plan, we're just leading ourselves into failure. Uh, so including it into the practice schedule is the very first thing that we should do. We should look at what we plan for athletes to do and, and set a fixed time. When we, when will we have strength conditioning? And then the other thing is to make it required, you know, have it be a necessary part of their training. That is, it's not a question. It's something that if they're going to be on that team or they're going to be in your program, that training the right way is a huge piece that is a non-negotiable. And so by implementing that and having it into the fabric of your program, you'll get little to no kickback because the athletes will understand and appreciate the necessity for it. The other thing we need to do is to create a method of logging their workouts. Now, if you plan on just having them do them at practice or having them do them at your gym with the coaches that can monitor things, then we may not necessarily need a logging system for their workouts. But if you do decide to implement days where they would train by themselves, then having a logging system is going to be extremely important. One way that I know some teams have done it is utilizing apps like Band where you have your communication with your athletes and coaches. Um, the, app, the coach can post a workout in the Band create an album that then the athletes would upload a time-lapsed video of themselves doing the workouts. They would set their phone up, put the time-lapsed camera on, they would do their workout, and then they upload that time-lapsed video to that particular uh, album to show that they performed that workout, um, which is a very easy way for coaches to, to hold the athletes accountable in doing their workouts. So having some sort of logging method where you're able to stay on top of their consistency is also very, very important. Even with the plan, a lot of times it becomes a, it becomes the sacrifice when we're getting short on time. So if, if coaches are, you know, practice is maybe running a little bit long and they're trying to get, you know, a few more reps of one specific thing, the strength and conditioning becomes what they'll sacrifice to allow for other things. And that takes away from the importance of it in your athlete's mind. In, in their minds, they're thinking, okay, we've, we're gonna start doing strength conditioning. But if it's the first thing that you omit or the first thing you say, well, we'll do that later, then they're also going to lose that mindset of importance. And so it becomes easy for them to say, well, coach doesn't think it's important, so it must not be important. And that's a really bad place to be. So do not let it become something that you sacrifice in the interest of time, because this can help to improve your athlete's ability to the point where all that extra time you're trying to spend on skill may be unnecessary because they're stronger and more capable from the strength and conditioning. So don't let it become something that you sacrifice. This is very challenging for some programs and I understand that, but in order to implement things appropriately, we have to have the right equipment to do so. We bought spring floors if you needed a spring floor. You bought a tumble track because you needed a tumble track. If you want if you recognize the importance of strength and conditioning and you understand the benefits it will have for your athletes and for your program, you must invest in the equipment necessary for the strength conditioning as well. It doesn't have to be you know, a $100,000 weightlifting set. It can be resistance bands at different levels. It can be dumbbells of varying weights. It can be kettlebells. It doesn't have to be an entire gym worth of equipment. It can be these lesser expensive pieces that we invest in and then again, have the athletes make sure they're taking care of them and make sure they're using them. An investment only feels wasted if it's not used. If you buy these, this equipment, provide that for your athletes, it's going to be seen as more of a benefit. It's going to be seen as something that puts your program ahead 
of other programs because you're investing in things that make your athletes better all around. So it's not wasted money. It truly is an investment that will pay massive dividends. And if the financial piece becomes too much of a burden, partner with a gym nearby, find a CrossFit gym, find a, uh, you know, a, a, a big box gym that you can create a relationship with to where perhaps they can allow athletes to come and train or they can provide a, a strength and conditioning coach or a trainer to come to your gym and help work with your athletes there. But reaching out to gyms in the, in the area can create an amazing relationship for your program and theirs and also give you guys the ability to use each other as resources to cross promote to market together but to create that connection in your community where people recognize your gym they recognize the training that you guys are doing and it also helps to bring more awareness to the sport which can then help to bring more athletes in your door which is a whole other a whole other realm of conversation that uh, for another time but partnering with a gym nearby is also extremely helpful and can help to push your athletes into a strength and conditioning program without necessarily having to invest so much. Um, and one thing that I do want to leave you guys with is strength conditioning is extremely important for athletes. We've talked about that in detail uh, today and that we could go on for, for hours and hours about the intricacies of it. But one thing I want to leave you guys with is at times it's really easy to use conditioning pieces as a punishment. Athletes maybe do something that we're not, you know, we don't favor. And the first thing we have them do is, is jump into a conditioning exercise, you know, do, you know, 50, 20 burpees or 10 burpees. And we use conditioning as punishment. Uh, if we want to grow our athletes and we want to explain to them and, and, and impart on them the importance of proper strength conditioning, then we don't want to use these things as punishment to deter them from wanting to do them. We want our athletes to look at strength and look at proper conditioning as a, as a benefit, as something that we we need and that we look forward to. And if we start to pair that with uh, strength and conditioning with punishment, it starts to create a connection that mentally we really don't want because it's only going to skew them or, or, or give them a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to strength and conditioning. Uh, we want this to be something that they look forward to because they recognize the benefits as much as you do. Thank you so much for joining me for this talk on strength and conditioning. If you would like more resources, please feel free to check out uh, our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the cheer doc. Check out our Instagram where we post free cheerleading strength conditioning uh, on a weekly basis. And then also check out the cheer doc.com where you can have uh, gain access to all of the programs. And if there are any ways that I can help you specifically, please reach out to me at the cheer doc at gmail.com. And I'd be happy to help guide your program uh, to meet the goals that you have for your strength conditioning. Thank you.